Hi friends, if you're enjoying this series and you'd like to help me reach even more people with Thinking Faith, please consider supporting the show. Silver supporters get early access to episodes and bonus content. Gold supporters also get signed books and a monthly catch up with me. The links to support are with the show notes or visit justinbriley.com. Enjoy today's episode. And Professor Flew, his, his arguments for atheism have influenced scholars for decades. But recently, he says he's changed his mind and he thinks that there is a God after all. Professor Flew, good morning. Uh, good morning. Do you think it's acceptable that you can teach this subject intelligence design in science classes? This is the renowned philosopher Anthony Flew being interviewed in 2004 by the BBC on why he had changed his mind about atheism, God and the origin of life. The thing which shows intelligence is the development from um, inanimate matter to living matter to the very, very big step of producing a creature capable of, of reproduction. What was so extraordinary about this interview is that from the 1950s to the 1980s, Anthony Flew was one of the best known intellectual defenders of atheism in the world. That is, until his shock announcement in 2004 that he had converted to belief in God. Flew's reasons were directly linked to the evidence he had been exposed to regarding the order and complexity required for life to emerge. I have always followed in my philosophical life the principle uh, that uh, Plato's Socrates accepted. We must follow the argument wherever it leads. I have followed the argument uh, to see uh, this intelligence at the, um, the stage before the origin of species. Flew went on to write about his change of mind in a book co-authored by Abraham Varghese titled There Is a God, How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Changed His Mind. It's important to note that Flew's change of mind was specifically to deism rather than theism, what he described as the Aristotelian God, an intelligence responsible for investing the cosmos with order and complexity, but who did not intervene personally in human affairs. But it was enough for many of Flew's atheist peers to denounce him as a heretic. Between his announcement in 2004 and his death in 2010, he was accused numerous times of being the victim of duplicitous Christians preying on a senile old man. Flew repeatedly rebutted such accusations, writing, I have been denounced by my fellow unbelievers for stupidity, betrayal, senility, and everything you could think of, and none of them have read a word that I have ever written. But Flew is far from being the only high-profile atheist philosopher to reconsider the question of whether we live in an unpurposed, unguided and ultimately meaningless universe. The atheist Thomas Nagel recently wrote a book called Mind and Cosmos and he said there are at least two things that atheists and Darwinists simply cannot explain. And when he wrote that book, Mind and Cosmos, he was responding to an ideology that he thought was exploding in popularity at the time. It's an ideology popular among fans of the new atheist movement that was going on at the time. And it's a position that he thought was also an overall attitude that's taken hold of academia more generally. What he's fighting against is what's often been referred to as material reductionism. This is just some of the response to the publication in 2012 of Mind and Cosmos by respected atheist philosopher Thomas Nagel, a book with the provocative subtitle Why the Materialist Neo-Darwinian Conception of Nature is Almost Certainly False. Recognising the fine-tuning of both the universe and biology for the emergence of life, Nagel says that nature manifests a purpose in the way it produces life and consciousness, which can't be accounted for by chance or physical laws alone. Once again, it sent shockwaves through the atheist community. Nagel, he's called a heretic by this Weekly Standard piece, not because he stepped out of line from the church, he's not a part of the church, because he's now been found as a heretic of the temple of of naturalism. The irony is that Nagel continued to identify as an atheist, yet 
one who nevertheless observes a mysterious and as yet undefined principle of purpose and progress that is embedded into the physical stuff of nature. But the response from Nagel's fellow skeptics was damning. Stephen Pinker dismissed Nagel's book as the shoddy reasoning of a once great thinker, while science popularizer Jerry Coyne wondered if Nagel is losing his critical abilities or simply is plagued by a nagging desire to go to church. Like Flew before him, Nagel stood condemned by the Church of New Atheism as a heretic for stepping outside the orthodoxy of scientific materialism. However, as we've explored early in this series, the Church of New Atheism was already being riven from within as they split over feminism, social justice and LGBT. But increasingly, I was seeing renowned atheists like Flew and Nagel questioning the very foundation of it all. What if the universe wasn't purposeless after all? What if there was some kind of mind behind it all? And then, in 2019, I met one of the most influential dissident thinkers of all. My conversation partners today are Roger Penrose and William Lane Cray. So, uh, Bill and Roger, welcome along to the programme. Thank Thank you. you. One of the most significant voices in cosmology is that of Nobel Prize winning mathematical physicist Sir Roger Penrose. Among the many stellar achievements of his career was working alongside Stephen Hawking to develop the singularity theorems for gravity and black holes in the 1960s. Penrose says he has no religious beliefs, but when he joined me for a big conversation from Premier Unbelievable to debate the nature of reality, he spoke at length about how mysterious he finds it that our limited human minds possess the ability to map out the universe and our own unlikely place in it in the first place. In fact, Penrose described three distinct mysteries. The fact that this world of physics seems to depend so extraordinarily precisely, and the more we explore it, the more precise we see this is, Mm. so we have these mathematical principles which, which govern in such a precise way, the way this physical world operates. Mm. And there is, if you like, a huge mystery. So that's mystery number one. Mystery number two is how is it that conscious experience Mm. can arise when the circumstances seem to be right. Certain brain structures somehow seem to give rise to this consciousness. And there is a genuine mystery, Mm. I think, and it's not just matter of you know compli- complicated compli- computations or something mm. much more subtle going on mm. so that's mystery number two and mystery number three is our ability to use our conscious understanding to comprehend mathematics mm. and these very uh, extraordinary uh, and self-consistent but deep ideas which are very far from our experiences so that's the, how, we, how we comprehend mathematics. Now, this is deep stuff, but don't miss the implications here. Roger Penrose, one of the most notable physicists in the world, believes that our best science shows us that there are in fact three separate realms of existence. The physical world, think of rocks, planets and the universe. The mental world, our thoughts, feelings and consciousness and the abstract world of mathematical laws and numbers. Simply in naming these as real, separate entities, Penrose has already stepped apart from the naturalism of his peers, such as Richard Dawkins, who claim that only one of them, namely the physical realm, exists. You believe that mathematics, for instance, is discovered rather than invented by Absolutely. us in that sense. It exists yes. independently. Yes, of us. right. Yes. And, 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 and one of those great mysteries, as you say, is the fact that we can access it. See, yes. It's itself a remarkable feat of, of reality. That's right, because it's so indirectly connected with our, uh, our uh, existence and what, you know, how we get along in the world and nat- how natural selection has helped us to to survive and so on, it's it's really hard to see how these things come about. We'll return to this conversation and Penrose's discussion partner later in today's episode. For now, I believe Penrose is another dissident thinker, questioning the materialist orthodoxy of so many of his scientific peers. He has said elsewhere, there is a certain sense in which I would say the universe has a purpose. It's not there just somehow by chance. I think that there is something much deeper about it, 
about its existence, which we have very little inkling of at the moment. Penrose stands in good company. As the founder of modern physics himself, Albert Einstein said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. All of these voices are saying something similar. There is a structure to reality that seems to have been intended and given to us, and from which we can make sense of the world we live in. As we conclude our current act, looking at the surprising rebirth of belief in God in the sciences, we'll be profiling more heretics and dissident thinkers who are rejecting the idea that we live in a purely material, meaningless cosmos of blind laws and chance. Instead, they're coming to the surprising conclusion that there really is a purpose, an order, a mind beyond matter. I'm Justin Briley, and throughout my working life, I've been hosting conversations on faith between atheists, agnostics and believers. In this documentary series, I'm telling the story of why new atheism grew old and secular thinkers are considering Christianity again. I'm speaking to those inside and outside the atheist movement and the many new thinkers beginning a new conversation on the value of faith. Along the way, we'll meet some of those who have found themselves surprised by God as they've made the journey from atheism to Christianity. Welcome to the surprising rebirth of belief in God, episode 20, The Logos Behind Life. just before we get into the rest of today's show, someone we've heard from quite a bit on the podcast is author and speaker Glenn Scrivener. Hello, Glenn. Hey, Justin. Always great to be here. Well, for a while now, you've been happily pointing people to your online course 321. Where did that come from? It's a passion of mine to help people get to grips with Christian faith and to do it in a way that's attractive and imaginative and deep and that assumes no prior knowledge. So 321 is my way of showing life according to Jesus. We want it to be like a mere Christianity for a digital age. Okay, so that sounds like it's maybe more for those who are not Christians. Well, yeah, many people have done it who are not Christians, and they've found faith for the first time. We're thrilled about that. But like with Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, Christians love that book too. And the first audience we have in mind for 3 to 1 is actually a Christian who wants to be refreshed in their faith and to have something to pass on to their Christian curious friends and family. Okay, so Christian or not, this basically gets people to the heart of the faith. Right. And nearly 10,000 people have joined the online platform. It's free. You watch these video-led sessions and you think through the stunning animations. You engage with the chat community. You get a ton of extra content thrown in. And now you have on your phone a mere Christianity that you can share with others. So the phrase we're using is you can share this without shame, without cost and without delay. Well, we've been really enjoying promoting 321 and listeners to this podcast can get into it instantly by going to 321course.com slash JB. That's 321course.com slash JB. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, Thank you, Justin. Keep up the good work. First of all, thank you for being here. Appreciate it. It is great to be here, Joe. Thanks for having I've, me. I've really enjoyed uh, watching some of your videos online and, and listening to these arguments. This is Joe Rogan, host of the most popular podcast in the world, interviewing Stephen Meyer, a founder of the Discovery Institute and one of the world's leading intelligent design proponents. This idea of intelligent design, my question to you, like right off the bat, was did you have a notion in your mind already that you were trying to prove Or was this something that you sort of started to believe upon the preponderance of evidence? It was more the latter, but I had a, by the time I first encountered it, a philosophical framework that made me open to it. Um, I had a long protracted uh, religious conversion from late high school all the way through college. It It was the last thing from a Damascus Road experience. Rogan went on to have a three-hour conversation with Meyer about faith, science, and the evidence for a creator as outlined in his books, such as Signature in the Cell and The Return of the God Hypothesis. 
But this interview in the summer of 2023 was particularly significant for a couple of reasons. Firstly, Joe Rogan rarely interviews Christian thinkers. Historically, his show was far more likely to feature explicitly atheist personalities like Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins and Bill Maher. Secondly, Meyer's background in intelligent design, a view that challenges evolutionary theory with scientific evidence for an intelligent mind behind life, would likely have disqualified him from appearing in previous years. The movement had been dismissed and even ridiculed by new atheists like Dawkins as creationism dressed up in a cheap tuxedo. Indeed, in 2005, a legal challenge in the USA, the Kitts Miller versus Dover School Board area trial, pitted evolution and intelligent design against each other in the courtroom. We have spent an enormous amount of time trying to prove to the court what everybody already knows, that intelligent design is a particular religious belief. And the court should not place itself in the position of determining the validity of a scientific theory. This should be done in the scientific community, debating it out. You, you say, let's debate it in the scientific community. This, there is no debate in the scientific community. Well, you guys well, are viewed as this, you, several... got, you guys are viewed as this outlying <laughs> source that no one believes as a scientific You know man. what? Apart from this courtroom verdict ruling intelligent design as unscientific, the movement was largely regarded as a fringe concern of religious fundamentalists, certainly unfashionable, even disreputable. So what had changed since the courtroom dramas of the mid-2000s to Stephen Meyer making his case on the planet's most listened to podcast? I spoke to Meyer, who told me that he and the Discovery Institute were never in favour of intelligent design being tried in a court of law. We, we thought it was poorly formed and we, we actually urged the school board to withdraw it. We thought it was, it was not the right way to go by any means. Uh, nevertheless, the trial ended the way it did. Uh, the, the, the ruling that was issued only applies to a, a small uh, jurisdiction in central Pennsylvania. So the constitutional status of teaching about the theory of intelligent design in American public schools is still uh, yet to be decided. Uh, but we have no interest, at least right now, in pushing that. Uh, we're much more interested in the discussion that's going on at the highest levels of science and academia. And so we made a strategic decision to stay out of it. My colleagues at the Discovery Institute and the wider network of scientists in the intelligent design research community. And instead, we started cranking out books and articles and peer-reviewed articles and uh, developing new research programs. And I think what's happening is we've been attracting some very high-profile converts to our position from within the scientific world itself. Uh, one notable person, for example, is Gunter Beckley, the German paleontologist who had started thinking seriously about intelligent design when he was curating the Darwin Bicentennial Exhibition at the uh, Stuttgart Museum of Natural History as one of the lead paleontologists there. And he began, partly because of a challenge from one of his colleagues, to read some of the books about intelligent design and realize very quickly that we had been unfairly maligned as creationism in a cheap tuxedo, creationism 2.0s. And uh, we in, engaged, began a long, long conversation with him. By 2016, 17, he was not only ready to express public skepticism about Darwinism, but his support for intelligent design. I too had been noticing more and more mainstream scientists and platforms willing to seriously engage the ideas of intelligent design, or simply ID as it's also known. Indeed, only recently Meyer has appeared on more big platforms such as The Piers Morgan Show, and even been hosted in friendly debate by atheists such as Michael Shermer, something almost unthinkable not that long ago. But what exactly is the theory of evolution that the ID movement critiques? Many people are familiar from school biology lessons with the basics of the theory first proposed by Charles Darwin in his 1859 work On the Origin of Species, describing evolution by natural selection. When life first emerged on Earth millions of years ago, it gradually branched out into the varied species and forms we see today through a series of incremental changes. Each small difference that gave a survival advantage and allowed a living organism to reproduce more easily was passed on to the next generation until we arrive at a world populated by everything from oak trees and dolphins to elephants and humans. 
In many ways, Darwin, although he never claimed to be an atheist himself, became the poster child of biologist Richard Dawkins and the new atheists who saw his revolutionary insight as a major nail in the coffin of the idea of a creator behind nature. Before Darwin, it was difficult to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. But once Darwin came along, the argument from design, which has always been to me the only powerful argument, it, even that isn't a very powerful argument, but I used to think it was, the only powerful argument for the existence of a creator. Darwin destroyed the argument from design, at least as far as biology is concerned, which has always been the happiest hunting ground for argument from design. After Darwin, you can be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. You can feel, really, now I understand how living things have acquired the illusion of design. I understand why they look as though they've been designed. Whereas before Darwin came along, you'd have said, well, I can see that the theory of a divine creator isn't, isn't a good theory, but I'm damned if I can think of a better one. After Darwin, you can think of a better one. Today, the so-called neo-Darwinian synthesis has married Darwin's insight with what we now know about genetics and DNA as the building blocks of cells and bodily characteristics. Every part of you is built from this blueprint called DNA. Its famous spiralling helix, identified by Francis Crick and James Watson in the 1950s, contains the microscopic building blocks of life, vastly long sequences of code written in four base letters, A, C, G and T. Every cell in your body contains billions of these tiny instructions which, through a remarkable and complex process, can store, copy and transcribe the information to develop new cells, organs and body parts. These long sequences are coiled so tightly that each cell contains two metres of code. If you unravel it all, the DNA in an average human body would stretch around the entire solar system twice. Crudely put, the neo-Darwinian synthesis says that this incredibly complex and integrated system emerged over a long period of time through random genetic mutations, which, when beneficial for an organism's survival, were selected for and passed on. The biological sciences have been dominated by this view since the mid-20th century, and books by Richard Dawkins, such as The Selfish Gene, have been an important part of popularising it for the general public. Now, as we'll hear later, the neo-Darwinian synthesis is being increasingly questioned by mainstream scientists. But there's an issue even before we get to the evolution of life. How did life itself begin? You can't have a process of evolution without first having the very long and complex string of proteins and nucleotides that make up even the most simple self-replicating DNA molecule. You need enormous complexity well before an evolutionary process has anything to work on. It's an issue that came up in a recent conversation between atheist YouTuber Alex O'Connor and Dawkins. The fact that Darwin solved the big one should gives us, give us confidence. That, that was the really difficult one, the, the, the amazing apparent design in the living world. I mean, that is such, an, such a, a staggeringly overwhelming impression of, of design. There's no question about that. And that was the one that Darwin solved. Well, Darwin solves the problem of complexity within living organisms, but I think it might be a step too far to say he solved the problem of life. Because, of course, one of the questions that we have to throw into that bundle of things yet to explain, the origin of the life. Origin, is, yes. The origin of life. Origin and of life. Well, that's not part of Darwinism, of course. That, right. That's a separate question, and Darwin acknowledged that. And that, that is an unsolved problem. It may never be solved in the sense that we may never actually know what the answer is. I think the best we can probably hope for is a model which is so elegant hmm. that we may say, well, that's, that's so elegant, it's got to be true. I mean, it, 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 but that's very, a bit different from having direct, direct evidence. Dawkins expresses confidence that we will come to a Darwinian-like explanation for how life arose. But Alex O'Connor's hesitation is worth dwelling on. Is Dawkins' confidence warranted? As Stephen Meyer explains, since the mid-20th century, the origins of life on Earth has become an increasingly contested area of science. 
origin of life and the nature of life are two very closely related questions. Because if we're trying to, if we want to explain the origin of life, we have to define what is it that we're trying to explain the origin of. And since the 1950s and 60s and 70s and right up to the present, every new turn has revealed a deeper and deeper and deeper layers of complexity in the living cell. So if we start in the 1950s, we get the famous Miller-Urey experiment. Um, they set up a spark discharge chamber, zap some um, chemicals with uh, electricity, and they produce some amino acids in their, in their vet, two, of, two or three of the protein-forming amino acids. Touted as a huge breakthrough, we're on the cusp of understanding how life arose from simple chemical uh, constituents on a prebiotic earth. That's the idea of chemical evolutionary theory, life from simple chemi chemistry. Ironically, in the same year, Watson and Crick elucidate the structure of the DNA molecule. Five years later, in 1957, 1958, Crick puts forward something called the sequence hypothesis. And because he realizes that on the interior of the DNA molecule, that famed double helix, you have these chemical subunits called bases or nucleotide bases, and he realizes that they're functioning as alphabetic characters in a written language or like the digital characters in a section of ma machine code. He re realizes, and very early on people realize, the DNA is, contains a kind of digital bit string, and that that information is being used to construct proteins in the protein machines in living cells. And it takes about seven years for Crick's sequence hypothesis to be confirmed by work that's going on in molecular biology on both sides of the Atlantic. It's a fantastic story in the history of science. But by the mid-60s, it's beginning to, to dawn on, on biologists in particular, but, but others as well, that we do indeed have an information storage and transmission and processing system inside the cell, and that you can't really build anything in life without the information in the DNA, at least. Later, we discovered there's other layers of information stored in life. There's the epi or ontogenetic layers of information, but even setting that aside, just taking us to the mid-60s in molecular biology, we now have something that's been revealed that completely destroys the idea, the 19th century idea of the cell as a simple homogenous globule of plasm, as Huxley put it. And so that now starts to put origin of life research under extreme pressure because the origin of life researchers now have to explain the nature of life as we find it, the, the actual complexity of the cell. Even Dawkins at one time seemed to overlook just how complex the problem of the origin of life is. This is John Lennox, Emeritus Professor of Mathematics and Philosophy of Science at Oxford University, reading from a famous 1986 book by The Biologist. I have here, because I don't want to misquote it, the famous statement in The Blind Watchmaker where he says, natural selection, the blind, unconscious, automatic process which Darwin discovered and which we now know is the explanation for the existence and apparently purposeful form of all life has no purpose in mind. It has no mind, no mind's eye. It does not plan for the future. It has no vision, no foresight, no sight at all. If it can be said to play the role of watchmaker in nature, it is that of the blind watchmaker. Now, that's marvelous writing. Mm. The rhetoric is terrific, but it's nonsense. But before we even go down that route, concealed in this famous statement of Dawkins is a huge mistake that he had later admitted. Because look at what it says. We now know that this is the explanation for the existence of life. Hmm. Do we? No. Darwin's natural selection and mutation, which Darwin knew nothing about, of course, is not an explanation for the existence of life for a very simple reason. Whatever natural selection does or doesn't do, it depends on life to mm. do anything. Mm. So it cannot explain life. Mm. Now, it took Dawkins years from writing that to admitting in one of his more recent books that evolutionary theories, Darwin's theory, does not deal with the origin of life. Now, that is hugely important because this simply drew the wool over people's eyes. Mm. Clearly, 
evolutionary processes are there. We all look different. There is variation. Yeah. Darwin saw it in finch beaks and all this kind of thing. But however far that reaches, and I think there may well be a limit, and that is being admitted by many biologists today, where it wasn't in the yeah. day that D Dawkins wrote this book. They think that the neo-Darwinian synthesis in the words of the systems biologist, Dennis Noble, who's a fellow of the Royal Society here in Oxford, doesn't need to be modified, it needs to be replaced, it's inadequate. Mm. But leaving that aside, we have the fact that life exists and this claim of Dawkins that permeates the whole of society, that evolution is the answer, is simply false. <laughs> It's no surprise that if an eminent scientist like Dawkins could make this kind of error, that so much of the public seems to assume that Darwinism explains where life came from. But as secular scientist Paul Davies told me on a big conversation from Premier Unbelievable debating the origins of life, there's a huge leap from chemistry to the first living cell. I presume Darwinian evolution sort of accounts for the origin of life, but of course you don't get an evolutionary process until you've got a self-replicating molecule, something that evolution can then go yeah, to work. It is really important point because Darwin himself would not be drawn on the origin of life. He said one might as well speculate about the origin of matter. Uh, so it's a wonderful quote, particularly as physicists have now explained the origin of matter. So, you know, can we now explain the origin of life? Um, uh, he, he did speculate about a scenario, uh, but uh, of course, you're absolutely right. His, uh, he gave us a theory of evolution about how life has evolved over billions of years from simple microbes to the complexity of the biosphere we see today. But he uh, didn't want to tangle with how you go from non-life to life. And for me, that's a much bigger step. Uh, because when people say, uh, well, uh, explain the, today's biosphere, you know, it's amazing. Um, uh, the, the transition from the earliest microbes to what we see today, of course, it's, a, it's an enormous amount of complexification, but it's got nothing on that first step of going from a mishmash of chemicals to the first living thing, because almost all the complexity in the biosphere is in the individual organisms, not in the, in, in the um, subsequent ecology and everything else. So how successful has the research been in giving a purely naturalistic account of how such a complex, self-replicating chemical code came into being? Jim Tor, Professor of Chemistry and Nanotechnology at Rice University, is a leading voice in the field. Speaking here on the Daily Dose of Wisdom podcast, he says that researchers can't even create a string of information in the lab, much less explain how it emerged in the oceans of early Earth. It's rough. The chemistry is very, very hard. And uh, uh, they'll use modern techniques and they'll try to insert themselves. They'll use what's called relay synthesis to try to ease the problem. All these things that an early earth never would have been able to deal with. And then once they get these basic raw building blocks of, of say, a sugar, an amino acid, and a nucleotide, now you've got to hook those things together. You have to make strings of them. Nobody knows how to do that. Nobody, that's in fact the, the, the basis behind my challenge. Nobody knows how to make those strings. And uh, because you have to make those to get your basic building blocks of a cell. Nobody can even make those yet. And then there's a much bigger inherent problem, which is you need the informational code. It's, it's like if you had a computer, but you had no software. Where is the software that's going to run these things? Nobody understands where the code is that, that encodes this thing. So these are all the problems with origin of life. And I'm just here pointing out the obvious. Truly, I'm pointing out the obvious. It's not like, wow, Jim Tour sees something that nobody else sees no i see what everybody else sees mm -hmm. every every other synthetic chemist every other organic chemist sees every problem that i see we don't really know how these essential building blocks of life like rna dna and protein came into existence this is christian philosopher william lane craig summarizing why the search for a natural explanation of the origin of life has hit the buffers Similarly, in a book by uh, Harold Morowitz, one of the 
most eminent origin of life researchers and his co-author, Eric Smith, they say, and I quote, we currently have essentially no understanding of what laboratory conditions would reproduce the emergence of life. Well, that's not different from what Tour says in perhaps just a more colorful way that we're clueless as to the origin of life. So contrary to the popular impression that's often given in high school uh, biology books and in the popular culture, contemporary science does not have uh, any understanding about how we got from point A to B and how life originated on this planet. However, as we heard last week, the universe is a very large place with lots of planets potentially capable of sustaining life. Richard Dawkins has in the past described life as a happy chemical accident. After all, in a universe billions of years old with billions of planets circling billions of stars in billions of galaxies, it's surely not too much of a stretch to assume that life, however improbable, will develop somewhere, right? Stephen Meyer. I've made a calculation in signature in the cell uh, that that will that actually shows that Dawkins is wrong. That the entire universe does not have what are called the probabilistic resources to explain the origin of the first um, crucial biomolecules by by chance alone. And I can you know run the numbers. So I did this based on the probabilistic resources from the Big Bang till now. So and there's been 10 to the 16th seconds since the Big Bang. There's 10 to the 80th elementary particles in the universe. There's, there's, you know, so I ran all the numbers and compared it to the vastness of what's called pro, uh, amino acid sequence space and the rarity of proteins within that space. And it turns out, if you change the metaphor a little bit, if you think of all the, all the combinations that there could be, the combinations that are functional are a tiny, tiny needle within that, that big haystack. And you don't have but a fraction of the time needed to search that that haystack, even with a a 14 billion year universe. So I don't think the Dawkins objection solves the problem at at all, even even as it were kicking it out into space or out into the universe. Certainly, there are origin of life researchers working on whether some kind of self-regulating principle in biology and chemistry could provide the grounds for the beginning of a naturalistic theory on how life self-assembled. But most people in the field seem to agree that we are still a long, long way from anything resembling a convincing theory of how the enormously complex, specified language of DNA could have arisen. Indeed, biologist Cy Gart says that trying to beat the odds with our current approach to science, in which blind natural forces are the only game in town, is misconceived from the outset. I mean, yes, there. if, if you're talking about having a very unusual thing happen, like, you know, a, a straight flush or a royal flush dealing out five cards. That's extraordinarily rare. But yeah, if you deal out a thousand hands, you might get one. That's not what we're talking about when we dis- discuss the origin of life. What we're talking about is something that doesn't seem possible. If you deal out, you know, a million cards, you will never see the ace of loops because there is no such thing (laughs) it doesn't exist so it's impossible to get a royal flush with the ace of loops now is that the case for the origin of life obviously not because here we are so that so we know that life began but we don't know how so when i say something impossible what i'm saying is that it's impossible based on the laws of science we now know in other words the laws of chemistry and uh, what's fascinating to me is how many non-theists are coming to similar co- conclusions. That we need so, we need other, we need new concepts. We need to include purpose, teleology, agency. Uh, the fact that, and this is this is astonishing, but it's something that is is real, is that even the simplest of microorganisms have cognition. Uh, they they make decisions. They they remember. They act in unison. They have a purpose. Uh, so we are just on the verge. This is much like the surprising birth. <laughs> we are on the surprising birth of a whole new way of understanding biology. And all of that, in my view, 
is going to point to the Creator God. We'll hear more about Cy Gart's personal story towards the end of today's show, but as we heard at the start of our episode, these are the kinds of reasons why notable atheists like Thomas Nagel have started to talk about purpose in the cosmos, or like Anthony Flew, have even come to believe in God. But is the idea of God, a mind behind life, even an option for a scientist? Is this a God of the gaps, an argument from ignorance? Isn't declaring that God did it simply throwing in the scientific towel? Stephen Meyer. Whenever we see information, especially in a digital or an alphabetic form, as we do in DNA and RNA, and we trace information back to its source, whenever we have a known source of information, it always arises from a mind, not a material process, whether we're talking about computer code or a hieroglyphic inscription or a, a Cyrillic text or English text or something in a book or the information we're transmitting over the internet or over radio signal, information always ultimately results from a mind. One of the early information scientists, Henry Quassler, said that it, uh, the creation of new information habitually uh, results from conscious activity. So my argument has been that when you, the, the discovery of information at the foundation of life is providing a powerful indicator of the activity of designing intelligence in the origin of life. And the absence of an alternative a credible alternative materialistic explanation is not the sole reason for the inference to design, but it reinforces it because what it shows is that the inference to design, we know of a cause that can produce information. The naturalistic models for the origin of life have not explained where information could come from. Therefore, the inference to design is not an argument from ignorance, but an inference to the best explanation. It's the only inference that's consistent with our knowledge of cause and effect, which is the basis, again, of all scientific reasoning. Thanks to Gareth, who wrote in to say, whether you're a person of faith, agnostic, atheist, or none of the above, this series is both genuinely thought-provoking and inspiring. I could not recommend it highly enough. Leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts or simply posting about us on your social media helps others to discover the show. If you want to follow more of my work, why not get my fortnightly newsletter? I'll even send you the first chapter of the Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God book for free when you subscribe. And if you'd like to support the show, you can get early access episodes and bonus content. Gold supporters will receive signed copies of both my books. For the newsletter and to support, visit justinbriarley.com or the links with today's show. In our last episode, we explored how a growing awareness of the extraordinary origins and complexity of a universe fine-tuned for the possibility of life is leading to a surprising rebirth of belief in God among the scientific community. The origin of life itself is another one of those scientific frontiers that seem to be attracting a significant number to look for agency, purpose and a mind behind it all. But the neo-Darwinian evolutionary paradigm itself has been largely unchallenged in the mainstream, that once we had that first speck of life, every subsequent species and form of life on Earth emerged through the completely natural operation of a set of blind laws over long stretches of time. As Richard Dawkins says, evolution, acting as a blind watchmaker and explaining away the appearance of design, has given many skeptics an intellectual rationale for rejecting any idea of a designer beyond nature. But there's an alternative story to be told about evolution and the development of life, largely unknown to the public, but increasingly making waves within the mainstream scientific community. The Royal Society in London, perhaps the most august scientific institute in the world, is a fellowship made up from the most eminent scientists, engineers and technologists from across the scientific landscape. Founded in 1660 with Robert Boyle and Isaac Newton among its first fellows, the Royal Society has long been a bastion for research and public education in biology and evolution. However, 
In November 2016, a major meeting at the Royal Society sent ripples of controversy through the scientific community. Some concerned members even tried to prevent the event from going ahead. The three-day conference, titled New Trends in Evolutionary Biology, saw pioneers of a movement known as the Third Way of Evolution present a radical new way of understanding the development of life to their scientific peers. Perry Marshall, author of the book Evolution 2.0 and a leading voice publicizing this new thinking in biology, was there. I went to that meeting and uh, before the meeting even started, you could tell that there was a very high level of energy in the atmosphere. There was a very high expectation that something really important is going to happen. And as soon as it started, I started hearing things that you would never hear on a large mainstream science stage. A lot of criticism of the old neo-Darwinian paradigm and the selfish gene viewpoint and, and the need for a viewpoint that cells are purposeful, tissues are purposeful, life is purposeful, that organisms engineer their own evolution. And there were only two old school neo-Darwinists there and they gave presentations and they would sometimes uh, come up in panel discussions and in questions. And I had never seen that group of people backpedaling, mumbling excuses and trying to save face um, the way that they were. I had always seen them being the bullies, having the upper hand and neither the audience nor the other speakers were having it. And it was, I mean, it was just a complete 180 from the usual stuff. And the people there, they were not, you know, bizarre fringe people. They were some of the most respected scientists in the world. But from a evolutionary biology point of view, most of these people had been sidelined and not listened to. And after that meeting, the tone in evolutionary biology shifted a lot. One of the organizers of the conference was the eminent Oxford physiologist and biologist, Dennis Noble. He told me about how he had come to completely change his view of the nature of evolution in the past few decades. I realized when I retired in 2004, so just 20 years ago, that this was big. This is the reason why gene-centric biology is actually nonsense. And it's now being proven to be nonsense. You don't have genes for this, genes for that, except in a very few rare genetic diseases affecting about 5% of the population. So I thought it's time to say, hey, wait a minute, we've actually got biology backwards. We think genes created us body and mind, that's to quote Richard Dawkins, the selfish gene, but they don't. It's the other way round. We are the controllers of what our proteins and the genes that enable them to be made do. It's very simple. It's like asking the question, is the music, the notes on the sheet of paper that Schubert wrote his uh, composition on? No, it isn't until somebody plays it. And that's the key. The active playing is us as organisms, which means even more relevant to your program that purpose in biology is back because what gives purpose in biology, it's us. It's us as creative individuals. Now, that's a very strange story going all the way from being a very reductionist, if you like, scientist working out heart rhythm to then coming out 40 years later to say, wait a minute, this is big. And it means that in biology, we've got the evolution story and the gene-centric story completely wrong. There's a potted history of what happened to me. 
One of the problems that Noble and many others in the third wave movement have been confronting is that the more we know of the internal workings of the cell, the more it seems to defy a gradualistic story of small changes accumulating over time. The same problem encountered in The Origin of Life presents itself, an extraordinary amount of specified complex information that allows the cell to flourish and directs it towards purposes larger than itself. DNA requires teleology first. It's an incredible process, the way in which cells handle our DNA. When the DNA is copied to be contributing to two cells and the cell dividing, which is an essential part of the development of the organism, then what you find is that the natural error rate in that copying is very high. Mm. No organism will be able to survive that. What does it do? The cell comes along and it corrects those errors. And from one in 10,000, you get one in 10 billion. Wow, which is quite it's, a low rate. It's extremely yeah. good mm. because most genomes are therefore copied completely faithfully. Mm. Now, why do I say that requires teleology first? The cell is a teleological structure. It knows, and I use that word advisedly, <laughs> it knows how to copy itself. That word teleology is one you'll hear quite a bit from now on. It's basically a fancier way of saying purpose in the direction of a goal. As Paul Davies told me, even the tiniest cell is a hive of extraordinary activity working towards a unified purpose, giving the example of just one particular microchemical machine. At, uh, at the level of complexity, so you mentioned the you know, kinase in Walker, so uh, there are many little um, uh, nano devices or nano machines that operate with extraordinary thermodynamic uh, efficiency, very close to what is uh, perfection. Uh, this uh, particular molecule you mentioned, um, it, uh, and it literally walks along fibers in cells delivering cargo. And uh, uh, there, are, there are many examples uh, of this, and it all has to be choreographed with uh, very great precision to work uh, properly. I mean, like an entire city of complex uh, processes going on, all interlinked and uh, coordinated with a, a coherent outcome. Uh, it, it just looks uh, really extraordinary. Perhaps the most extraordinary thing is the discovery that cells are able to adapt and transform themselves in response to changes in their environment far faster and more efficiently than can be explained on the lengthy timescales involved in the neo-Darwinian model. Perry Marshall. I'll just give you one example. Uh, Michael Levin he took lung cells out of a cadaver who had just died, so the cells are still alive, uh, put them in a petri dish so that they had nutrients, and they spent about three days reforming themselves into, you could only describe as a different organism, they turned inside out, and the cilia that used to push mucus out of the lung uh, turned into propellers and they started swimming around. And when they put damaged nerves in the Petri dish, the former lung cells went and attached themselves to those nerve cells and started repairing the nerve damage. Now, these they have the same genomes as lung cells or as a human, but they are functioning as an autonomous organism that is no longer a lung and operating cooperatively, it's likely that they are picking up signals from the nerve cells. We don't know this for sure. It's a good guess they are picking up signals, uh, maybe even SOS signals, and helping uh, them along. And experiments like this show that the genome is just a servant of what the larger organism is doing, and that biology is first and foremost cooperative and not competitive. There's an entire narrative that the world runs on natural selection and survival of the fittest, and it, it's so pervasive that it is completely overwhelmed the way even scientists work with each other and treat each other. Uh, science is a very 
cutthroat profession. And I think it's partly because of this narrative that we've had that very poorly reflects the way organisms really work. This is the surprising turn that biology has taken. It seems as though cells themselves are at some level almost conscious in their ability to adapt, repair, and work together for a unified purpose. Unsurprisingly, this revelation has opened up the question of design and purpose behind living things in a whole new way. Marshall has even convened a task force looking at how this new understanding of the cell could create breakthroughs in cancer research. And the movement only seems to be picking up steam. When Dennis Noble entered a public debate in Oxford with Richard Dawkins on the subject, many say that the atheist biologist had little to say in defence of neo-Darwinism. At the time of our conversation, Noble himself had recently returned from a trip to South Korea, speaking to an audience of thousands about the new wave in evolution. I get no pushback at all now in what I propose on this. On the contrary, we have only in the last year had several special issues of journals, special productions of books in parts of series that have been portraying exactly uh, this kind of question. So all the way from 2016, when there was an attempt to actually get the Royal Society meeting cancelled, that actually happened. Um, all the way from there to now, we've seen a shift in position. And I think it's not impossible that at some stage in the near future, this view that we have to regard organisms as purposive and that's something for us to investigate as scientists, I can see that becoming the standard view. But there's a prediction. You'll find out in, say, 10 years' time whether I'm right. And the usual bullies just went silent back to Perry Marshall, reflecting on the aftermath of the 2016 Royal Society Conference. People could hardly get uh, folks like Jerry Coyne or Daniel Dennett or Richard Dawkins to even comment on it. Um, and uh, Dennis can tell more, but my understanding is that uh, one of the reasons Dawkins debated Dennis was because of there was peer pressure inside of Oxford, like, uh, Richard, if you are a real scientist and you really care to defend your views, you really ought to take on your opposition. And, and so th the tone of evolutionary biology changed a great deal after that meeting. And um, it, it became much easier to have conversations about purpose teleology, teleonomy, all, all those kind of words that uh, technical uh, people use to describe such things. And and I think the last, so now we're seven or eight years later, we're in a whole different ball game than we were before. But how does all this connect with where we began, the contested theory of intelligent design? Because of its associations with creationism and the ridicule poured on it by new atheist scientists, the mere mention of ID has historically generated an almost allergic reaction among many in the scientific community. Many of those in the so-called third way movement, not wanting their research to be saddled with the same controversy, seem to have steered clear of using terms such as design in their findings. Yet, as far as I can see, to quote Shakespeare, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. In the end, phrases such as purpose, agency and teleology really amount to the same thing as design, whether conceived of as God acting at various points to bring life into existence or as an order pre-programmed into life from the outset, the idea is that there is something driving life that transcends the blind forces of nature. Stephen Meyer was also at the 2016 conference and believes that its findings have spurred a new openness towards intelligent design as a serious hypothesis. The end of it, one of the conveners characterized the conference for its lack of momentousness, essentially uh, suggesting that the, the conferees had done a good job of defining the problems associated with neo-Darwinism, particularly 
the lack of creative power associated with the mutation selection mechanism, but had come up with no mechanisms nor any broader theory that could compensate for the explanatory deficits of the received theory. So I, I think one of the things that's going on is that neo-Darwinism, which has also been a key plank in the whole worldview of the scientific atheists, is itself in trouble, even among evolutionary biologists. And so I think that's been one of the intellectual shifts that, may, that has made, have made people more open to, to our point of view. And uh, I think there's very exciting and powerful positive evidence for intelligent design, both in cosmology and physics, and, but also in biology. So far in this episode, we've met a number of dissident voices in the scientific community, putting purpose, agency and intelligence back at the centre of science. Some of them hesitate to label this phenomenon in supernatural terms, but when we zoom out from the specifics of biology or even the fine-tuning of the universe and its origins, the very fact we can do science itself seems to suggest some kind of, well, mind that exists beyond the cosmos. In 1962, Nobel Prize winning physicist Eugene Wigner wrote a paper titled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences, saying the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. This was the very issue that eminent physicist Roger Penrose told me about near the start of today's show, when on a big conversation from Premier Unbelievable, he confessed his amazement at the existence of three interlocking aspects of reality. The material, the mathematical, and the mental. What could ground these three phenomena? His conversation partner, Christian philosopher William Lane Craig, offered a solution. Take mystery number one, the applicability of mathematics. I think this is a huge issue because on Platonism, you have this abstract, atemporal, non-spatial realm of causally effete objects, and the physical world happens to operate according to certain mathematical principles that yeah. you've described. And as uh, Mary Leng, who is a philosopher of mathematics at the University of Liverpool, has said, on Platonism, the applicability of mathematics to the physical world is, is a happy coincidence, <laughs> which just seems incredible. By contrast, we know that minds can design things. And the view that there is an omniscient uh, mind who has designed the physical world on the mathematical blueprint that it had in mind is a very ancient perspective that goes back to Middle Platonism and people like Philo of Alexandria, who said that the intelligible world, the intelligible cosmos, exists first in the mind of the logos, the, the divine intellect, and then is instantiated in the physical world uh, by the logos who creates the world on this blueprint. And that seems to me to be uh, a good solution to the one and the many problem. I, the thing is that you call it a solution. I, the trouble is, it's, it's, I think my problem is it's too vague. I don't see how you can do much with this particular view. You see, we, 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 when it comes to the explanation of how a physical world operates in terms of mathematics, it's extraordinarily precise. Mm. And, and one can say an awful lot about that. But a statement like the one you mm -hmm. make here it worries me because it's... You know, it, you can call it a solution, but it doesn't tell us very much. Well, I don't but even it know what solves I, the mystery. I don't even know what, it, what you say that. <laughs> Is it because it's very hard to then investigate yeah. this this explanation itself, that you'd you'd have like to there's be a mystery behind the mysteries? You, you need to be able to say, uh, how could you contradict such a view? You see, it's it's so oh. so vague in a way. I mean, why wasn't there a, 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 a mind which was in some malicious, well, maybe it is malicious, I don't know, we, we don't... Um, it's just saying it's a mind without telling us... Right. I haven't said anything about yes. the moral properties of this. Uh, <laughs> yes. But I would be prepared question, to. Yes. I, I mentioned yeah. earlier that among the logically necessary truths that this mind would know and ground would be not only mathematical truths, but certain ethical truths. Mm -hmm. I think certain ethical principles are not contingent, but are necessarily true. 
And so this would provide a grounding for the objectivity of moral values and duties in a paradigmatic good. This being would be not only the source of the mathematical realm, but of the ethical realm in being the supreme good. And so now we're beginning to add a little more content to this notion. As the creator of the physical realm, this mind would have to be uncaused, timeless, spaceless, immaterial, enormously powerful. In order to cause the ethical realm, it would have to be good, perfectly good, and to cause the mathematical realm, it would have to be omniscient. And so we're winding up, I think, with a very rich theological ultimate. You've probably noticed that what William Lane Craig has just described sounds suspiciously like God. But it was evident that Penrose, despite his wonder at the synchronicity of reality, struggles with the concept of a God as an explanation. Paul Davies, who we've already met this week and previously, is another fascinating secular physicist and astrobiologist. He directs the Beyond Center at Arizona State University and is a widely published author and speaker. Davies does not describe himself as religious, but has nevertheless been something of a long-standing thorn in the sides of the new atheists. Why? Because he doesn't believe that the deep questions that the universe and biological life pose to us can be solved on a purely physical account of science. When he joined me on The Big Conversation, I didn't want to let the discussion finish without pressing him on where he stood on the God question. I've just been wanting to ask you the whole time really is is where you feel you stand on the sort of religious spectrum. I think you've described yourself as not conventionally religious, but that doesn't seem to rule out a, a, a sort of religious uh, dimension to, to, to you. Is there some kind of agency behind the universe? Is there, you know, is there something pushing things towards this, to consciousness and life and everything else? Uh, would, would you be willing to share? When people ask me about my uh, religious position. I normally start out by saying, well, it's not this and it's not that and uh, 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 and so on. So I don't like the idea of, uh, of miracles. I don't like the idea of a God who uh, sort of meddles in the affairs of the world. Um, but uh, and also, I, I don't like the idea of a God who's sitting around for all eternity and then made the Big Bang go bang at some arbitrary moment. Uh, and so uh, I think, however... Uh, we live in a universe uh, that is remarkable in many ways, uh, the laws of physics themselves. Uh, where did they come from? Uh, why do they have the form that they do? Uh, most of my colleagues just accept them as a brief fact, uh, but it seems to me that uh, there should be a deeper level of explanation. I'm not sure that God is an appropriate term for that, but if part of uh, what is involved in the laws of physics is something like a life principle, uh, then... Uh, what we're talking about is something that explains uh, the order of the universe and uh, our place within it. What is undeniable, and can't be a scientist without supposing that there is a rational order in nature that is at least in part intelligible to us. And I'd just like to say a few words about that in the second aspect, the intelligibility. Uh, I think someone said that the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. Uh, people will often shrug this aside. Scientists themselves will shrug this aside. Uh, of course, um, the scientists can understand the universe because they're paid to do that. That's their job. Uh, it, they find it no surprise. I think it's absolutely staggering uh, that the human brain, which has evolved so to survive in the proverbial jungle, uh, has within it the ability to decode nature uh, in this uh, thoroughly deep manner that is... Uh, typified by theoretical physics. Um, many animals are better at uh, jumping streams or catching objects than, than we are. Uh, oh, when Newton saw the apple fall, uh, he didn't just see a falling apple. Uh, he, he saw a set of differential equations that connects the motion of the apple to the motion of the limb. And likewise, uh, in decoding nature, through science, uh, through science and mathematics, what we're finding is hidden linkages uh, that are not apparent uh, to any other organism that we know. Uh, in other words, that we have tapped in to this deeper 
substructure in nature. Some people call it the cosmic code. Uh, we talked about genetic code, the cosmic code. We can decode the cosmic code. Uh, and we've done splendidly well. Now, that doesn't mean that we understand everything. There are still some gaps in our knowledge. But when you think about the last 300 years, uh, our advance has been enormous in comprehending the world. So uh, we were talking earlier about sort of directionality uh, in the universe, going from matter to life uh, to in consciousness. I would add comprehension to that. There's, there's a sort of arrow of time in the direction of comprehension. And, and if that is the case, if this is not just uh, an enormous fluke, a happy series of accidents, it can be established that that is a general uh, tendency, uh, then that, to me, comes very close to something like a meaning or a purpose in nature. It's certainly a directionality in nature in a certain scheme of things, but it's a scheme of things that we can come to understand. And, and so I set huge store by this ability to do science and do mathematics, the comprehensibility of the world, I think is uh, the absolute key to there being something deeper behind it. And it's something that we, as representatives of comprehending organisms, uh, are tapped into in a very fundamental way. So yes, I think that's a sort yeah. of religious sphere. Well, I'd say called a cosmic religious sphere. To quote Davies again, he said... I think that's a sort of religious feeling, what Einstein called a cosmic religious feeling. Terms like miracle, mystery and religious feeling are not the sorts of words we normally associate with science, yet these are the words many secular scientists and thinkers are now reaching for as we witness the kind of directionality Davis describes of the universe going from matter to life to consciousness to comprehension. When I hear such statements, I'm reminded of the Greek word logos. It can convey reason, order, or a meaning-giving principle. Our word logic comes from it. Famously, it's also the term used in the opening chapter of John's Gospel to describe the pre-existent Christ of the Godhead as the creative, life-giving word through whom all things were created. Given that the DNA code itself is equivalent to a language that you and I and every living thing are written in, perhaps it's no surprise that the more we learn of the way our origins defy a purely naturalistic account of time and chance, the more scientists may be tempted to lean towards a religious flavour in expressing it. I asked Stephen Meyer if he was seeing a move towards God in the sciences. My, my book is called The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God. It touches on science, but lots of other areas where I see there being a kind of a new openness to, to God as an explanation for things. Um, in the science community then, uh, do you think that we are moving in a similar direction that, that actually, you know, through things like the fact that the neo-Darwinian synthesis just doesn't seem to be holding water anymore, the fact that we are having these extraordinary, you know, revelations about the nature of our universe and so on, do you think... That's actually coming back to God. Um, is that the where people are ultimately landing? Um, or will it take, I don't know, they say science progresses one funeral at a time. Maybe it'll take a few generations before there's an openness to that again. I don't know. I see that happening in my, my experience, not only among some very seasoned and senior scientists who have had conversions, my interest in this whole topic began when I was early in my career and I attended a conference where Alan Sandage announced publicly his conversion to Christianity, not in spite of scientific evidence, but because of it. He was a, a pretty well-known, hard-bitten scientific materialist who began to have a real deep and deliberative um, set of conversations with colleagues about the meaning of the new cosmology. And he realized that there was something in him that did not want there to be a beginning to the universe. And he realized that the reason for that was it had obvious metaphysical implications. Um, at that same conference, Dean Kenyon announced that he had repudiated his own theory of chemical evolution and stated that it was now time for the philosophers to reopen the natural theological conversation and that he himself was becoming sympathetic to the design hypothesis. So I began, that's, that was you know very early in my career in the mid 80s. And so I've had the 35 years to think about this, and I found that there are many, many scientists who have been on that same exact trajectory. Gunter Beckley, as I mentioned, um, I think Jim Tour, who 
has been a, a believer for a long time, but is I think increasingly interested in these these origins questions and seeing that they they do not point in the materialistic direction. And the other thing I'm seeing is that a lot of younger people, we have these summer programs for young people, and we're att attracting an incredible amount of uh, very energetic talent. And I, I think people are ready for, to look at biology in particular in a new way. Uh, biology, systems biology is a big new direction. And I think looking at biology as a design system uh, leads to making predictions that can be tested in the laboratory. It leads to new approaches to studying life. And so it's it's not just a matter of saying God did it. It's a matter of saying, well, there if life was designed, then what else should we expect to find? Maybe that junk DNA isn't going to turn out to be junk after all, just to name one example. And it didn't, you know, so that was an ID prediction. So anyway, I think it's a new day in science and there's a tremendous amount of energy around looking at life as a design system, looking at the universe as a design system, and then seeing where that leads. That is taking us back full circle to the, the scientific revolution. Uh, Newton's God hypothesis was not a science stopper. It was a science starter for him. And you'd be hard pressed to find anyone in the history of science who was more productive than, than, than Newton was. I believe that just as we're seeing a rebirth of belief in God among secular intellectuals in conversations around culture and meaning, we're also seeing a similar surprising rebirth among the scientific community. Something has changed in the past few years, an openness to purpose, agency, even a mind behind it all. As with the cultural conversation, many of the voices featured today are at different points on the spectrum, ranging from a sense that there is a mysterious, deeper purpose to those who have become convinced that there is a God. But there are, of course, many scientists who have journeyed all the way to Christian faith. I usually think of my parents as something I call ideological atheists, committed to the idea that there is no God, can, cannot be a God, and religion is evil. Uh, Christianity was responsible for most of the evil. It was a tool of oppression. So that's how I grew up. Uh, I read Soviet uh, published books translated to English for children. <laughs> and many of them were anti-religion, anti-God. Uh, so I just assumed that that was the case. You know, that lasted pretty well into my youth, into my early adulthood. This is Cy Gart, whose colourful upbringing includes being raised by parents who were committed Marxists, a story he tells in his autobiographical book, The Work of His Hands, A Scientist's Journey from Atheism to Faith. His communist parents passed on a love of science to their son, but also a commitment to atheist materialism. What happened was that, you know, the science that I had thought I knew was very materialistic. And, you know, the idea was that everything is easily explained by a, a group of equations. And, you know, there are no mysteries. Some things we don't know, but we'll eventually solve them using the same methods. But the problem is that when I learned quantum mechanics and especially things like, you know, the uncertainty principle, uh, it said, no, there are things we can't know. We but when I started studying the details of biochemistry, for example, how proteins are made, I, I just felt chills going up and down my spine, literally. I, I, I just thought, this is unbelievable. How did, how did this happen? How, how do we have such an incredibly complicated, beautiful system in every cell of our body? And I had no idea what the answer, I knew there was an answer. I thought it was probably evolution was doing it because, you know, certainly evolution does a lot of things. But still, it, it, it raised in me questions about how can we really answer all these questions that are coming up from science itself. And that did not lead me to theism, to believing in God. I, I don't think it ever came up in my brain, but what it did do was kind of break down this certainty that science is the answer to everything. As his career in science progressed and Sai began to question his faith in pure materialism, his hard atheism softened into something more like agnosticism. Sai began looking into religious traditions, but wasn't convinced by any of them. 
Eventually, in his mid-40s, he was persuaded by a friend to try church for the first time. Contrary to everything he had come to believe about Christianity through his upbringing, Sai enjoyed the experience, finding the community welcoming and the message helpful. Nevertheless, he was still a long way from becoming a Christian. But things began to change following some unusual personal experiences, starting with some vivid dreams. Well, the first one, well, I was, I was still, I, I was much younger, and I may have still considered myself an atheist, or maybe on the verge of. I, I, I'm afraid of heights, and this was a nightmare because I was holding on by my bare hands to a cliff. I was just, you know, about to fall. And I was terrified. I started calling help for help, and I heard a voice say, "Just let go." And I thought, that's crazy. I can't let go. I'll fall down. And the voice said it a couple of times. And then eventually I said, well, I'm falling anyway. So I let go. And as I let go, the world turned 90 degrees. And instead of being vertical, hanging off a cliff, I was lying on the ground, horizontal. And instead of hanging onto a cliff, I was holding onto a boulder lying on the ground. And I looked up and there was a man standing there. That was, and I realized that was the man who had said, just let go. I woke up. Uh, I had no idea what that dream meant, uh, and, but it was so vivid. Uh, I mean, I can see it now. <laughs> I mean, I, I've never forgotten the, the images and um, I didn't know what it meant. And I, I put it aside. Uh, the second dream was much later and I was already, I think I'd already been to that church. I, I hadn't read anything in scripture, which I did later, but in that dream, I was I was uh, near a walled garden uh, and I wanted to get in. It was a, it, the walls were very high and I tried to get in by climbing over the walls. I kept climb, trying to climb up and I couldn't. It was very frustrating. I walked around and I couldn't find a better place and finally uh, a man appeared and said, what are you trying to do? I said, I'm trying to get into the garden and I can't climb over the wall. And he said, well, why not use the door? And I looked and there was a door and I walked in. Now, uh, when I woke up from that dream, I knew who the man was because by then I had been doing a little research, gone to the church, and I knew that was Jesus. And what I did not know at that time was the scripture that says, knock and it shall be opened. And, you know, <laughs> when I finally saw a, a stained glass window with that, with a picture of Jesus knocking on the door and, and you know, I, I had quite an emotional response to that. <laughs> was, was it a big shift as you started to take the possibility seriously of God and, and of Jesus? Did it in any way create any conflicts with your sort of scientific worldview or, or, or did you find actually that it, it came alongside it quite quite happily? At, at that point, I was I was still not a believer. I, I, I thought this might be true and one of my arguments against it was that I'm not going to give up evolution. I'm not going to give up my scientific worldview. And also, I just I just didn't feel ready to, to make that huge shift to say, I believe in this supernatural, you know, story, which, you know, my whole upbringing had been against. But then <laughs> it wasn't a dream that brought me. It was a waking experience. And I was uh, driving in my car and, uh, listen, and I turned on the radio. This is in the middle of Pennsylvania. And I heard a Christian station and I heard a a preacher preaching and I really liked the way I didn't wasn't really listening to what he said, but I, I liked the way he spoke. And I and I, I thought, well, gee, that that would be interesting. What what would I say if I wanted to, you know, say something like that, give a sermon, which is kind of funny. And uh I started and and, and then I had this, some kind of a strange thing happen, which I can't I have no idea how to explain it, but I, next thing I knew, I was preaching a sermon uh, to a, a group of people somewhere outside. And uh, fortunately, I pulled the car over <laughs> and, uh, and heard myself. 
preaching words that didn't come from me, but included the, the phrase, uh, I know that God loves all of you because he loves even me. And after I had said that to myself, I began crying uh, uncontrollably and realized and said out loud, I believe. I, I knew that those words came from, they didn't come from me, they came from the Spirit. And uh, there was no denying. I mean, it, the way I put it is, I was dragged over that threshold. <laughs> I, I didn't step over it, I was pulled. And there was nothing I could do about it. So at that point, I was faced with the problem you raised. Now what? What, do I quit science? And it turned out there's no conflict at all. None. Sai told me that he doesn't think his personal experiences, dramatic as they were, will necessarily serve as evidence for someone else. Nor does he necessarily expect others to experience these kinds of encounters themselves. However, as he began to meet other scientists of faith, he began to find evidence that he could share with others, especially in the harmony he was discovering between his science and the concept of a creator behind that science. There was just one problem. Sai had become a Christian in the early 2000s, just at the time new atheism was getting going. How would this affect his newfound faith? I was a new Christian, suddenly surrounded by, <laughs> you know, new atheism. And I, I will be honest with you that when I heard about the God delusion, before I actually read it, but when I heard about it, Dawkins had been a hero of mine, my, I don't know, the decades. Uh, and uh, when I saw that he had written this book, The God Delusion, I was quite nervous. I was afraid that, you know, this would send me back. Uh, I would read it and be convinced that I was wrong. But exactly the opposite happened. I read The God Delusion and I said, well, I guess I was right. I mean, I, I found that book completely uh, non-convincing, to say the least, and uh, and affirming of my, of my newfound faith. And not only did I respect and admire Dawkins, I actually had some correspondence with him about about Darwin and He's even mentioned me in one of his books, you know, uh, as someone who found out something interesting about Darwin. So this was a shock uh, to me, and I I, uh, I recovered, <laughs> and I just decided, well, okay, so I, I'm I'm safe. Uh, the whole tone of this kind of new atheism was so negative and so depressing. And, uh, just, you know, the, the famous Dawkins quote, which is at bottom, the universe is, is just nothing but pitiless indifference, you know, and, and I even have a chapter in my, in, in this book called Pitiless Indifference. I mean, it, yes, it's absolutely true. The universe is full of pitiless indifference, but the exception is the planet Earth because we are not pitilessly indifferent. It's demonstrable. So it's, it's a false statement. I suppose I could see I can see all kinds of ways in which your own scientific kind of interests and research were, were guiding you towards sort of questioning that that atheism. I mean, as a scientist, how how do you engage with those claims that I think a lot of people do struggle with, even if they're sort of attracted at some level to Christianity, that a person called Jesus Christ is God, came to be part of this creation, died and then resurrected again. A lot of people, you know, they would say, well, I am a scientist and that's the one I find hard to, to swallow in the end. It's a great question, Justin. Um, you know, I don't have any problem. Uh, one thing that I found very interesting about the New Testament, and it's specifically the Gospels, is that Jesus doesn't say one word about science. This is God incarnate. He quotes scripture. He never says, well, you know, Genesis was a little off. It really wasn't, you know, it there was a lot of other things that happened. And uh, he didn't have to refute the 6,000 year thing because that came much, much, much later. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he never told us anything about science. And this is God. So why? And I, I think the answer, at least for me, is clear. 
science keeps changing. There is no correct science. In other words, the science we know today is not the final answer any more than it was in 1780. And it's going to keep changing. So, so what, would, what would God tell us? Here's the scientific truth. Not only would the people of the time not understood it, we wouldn't understand it because we're not there yet either. Understanding the truth of the natural world is our job. That's what we do as humans. And God is smiling on us every time we get something right. We get a paper in nature and everybody loves it. He smiles. But he's not telling us what it is. And so the Bible is, not only is it not a scientific textbook, it's almost exclusionary of science. It's not, it's, it's not God's job to explain it to us. So now in terms of the resurrection, that's not scientific. People don't rise from the dead. Absolutely true. People don't rise from the dead. And Jesus Christ was a person, but he was also God incarnate. Okay. And God incarnate can rise from the dead because he's God. So I, that doesn't bother me at all. You, you obviously see that the natural world and our exploration of it is is a God-given gift in that sense, you, that, that any time that we are exploring and un, unearthing and uncovering the mysteries of science and the universe, that, that we're in some sense, we're, we're worshiping God in, in, in doing that. Yes, absolutely. God wants us to do science. He wants us to make these discoveries. He's not telling us. He wants us to make these discoveries and learn about the natural world. It's his creation. There are many ways to praise God. There are many ways to worship. Uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, on your knees in church, or it doesn't have to be singing a hymn. It can be walking through a forest and, and looking at the leaves and, and seeing how beautiful they are and the flowers, but also knowing how they work. You know, how photosynthesis works, how the sunlight is converted, knowing that just increases your feelings of worship and praise. It's interesting to hear you say that because I often get contacted by people who I think see the way that other people experience faith in, in maybe quite emotional or, you know, experiential ways. And they say, I never really had that experience. I'm, a, I'm more of a logical person, I'm an engineer, or I'm a scientist, or whatever. And I sometimes wonder whether we just need to give people permission to realize that they can experience God in, in, in all kinds of other ways. And, and exactly as you say, the, the wonder that comes often with just realizing just how extraordinary life is by analyzing it and doing experiments, that, that, that is a perfectly legitimate way of encountering the awe of God, the wonder of God, without necessarily being some spine-tingling moment, you know, singing a, a song in church or whatever. I, I don't know what your thoughts are on that side. I have a chapter in, in this second book, in this uh, Science and Faith and Harmony, called The Voice of God. The chapter is relates to personal experience I had with a couple of dolphins when I was out in the ocean. Uh, that I was still an atheist, but that experience was religious to me. And I think what you said is true, Justin. Uh, people have religious experiences all the time, but they don't recognize it. They don't realize it. We don't, we don't, we don't get those little clues, you know? We don't see the things that are happening. Uh, and some of those things are God's calling us. So what I say to people like who, who tell me that, and I get quite a bit, <laughs> Uh, I say, okay, it, God has not called you with a dream like I had or with a giving a sermon like I had, but he's calling you. And you just have to open your mind as to what that call could be. It could be anything. It could be a child smiling at you as you walk by. It could be some anything. And if you're, if you're more open to listening, you'll hear it and it'll change it. Psygart, the new book he referenced, Science and Faith in Harmony, is out now. Psy discovered what many of the scientific pioneers before him had also believed, that God speaks, yes, through personal experience, but also through two books, 
One book reveals the story of his promises to a chosen people and their fulfillment for everyone in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That book is the book of scripture. But the other book that God reveals himself through is the book of nature. It's another book that is open to everyone, believer or not. Thousands of years ago, a poet compared the cosmos to a royal herald announcing news of a king who rules it, writing, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. The writer of Psalm 19 intuitively sensed that the grandeur of the universe points beyond itself. Our awe at the size, scope and complexity of our home in the cosmos has only increased in the intervening centuries as science has unfurled before us the universe that we're part of. We have discovered layer upon layer of dazzlingly serendipitous features. In the Big Bang, we see time, space and matter come into existence. In the mind-bogglingly specific fine-tuning of the universe's fundamental parameters, physical matter was primed for the conditions that allow life to exist. Then, in the extraordinarily complex and efficient information system of DNA, that inert matter somehow turned into living, replicating organisms, and those first forms of life eventually led to a sentient, self-aware consciousness like ours, intelligent, thinking humans, capable of asking the kinds of questions that we've explored in this act of our series. These extraordinary facts leave us with important questions. Why does inert physical matter go to all the bother of becoming complex, conscious living beings at all? Is this just the ultimate coincidence? Are we really the fluke happenstance of a mindless, unguided physical process? Or is the synchronicity that led to our existence best explained by a mind that transcends the time, space and matter of the universe and its physical processes? I believe that if we are seeing a surprising rebirth of God in our culture, one of the most surprising places it's happening is among the scientific community itself, discovering the Logos behind life. You've been listening to The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God, telling the story of how new atheism grew old and secular thinkers are considering Christianity again. Material from The Unbelievable Show was used by permission of Premier. Visit premierunbelievable.com for full shows or today's show notes for links to all archive materials used in this episode. And just to remind you, this podcast series is also a book. You can read the first chapter for free when you join my newsletter at justinbriley.com, where you can also order the book or get a signed copy. Supporting via Patreon or tax-deductible giving from the USA will give you early access to new episodes of the podcast and access to bonus content. Find out more and how to support my efforts to bring thinking faith to the secular and Christian world at justinbriley.com. The links are with today's show. Coming up next time... Jordan was sitting in the office. The doctor was talking to both of us. We were both receiving the news. The first person I told was Julian. And when I told him, Julian, only God knows when I'm going to die. The doctor, he has an opinion, a, a medical opinion, and but it's an opinion. It's, it's not a certainty. Only God knows when I'm going to die. Jordan can't even, he can't even explain it, which is hard on his um, logic. It's hard on his logic. Yeah. <laughs> Tammy Peterson talks to me about terminal cancer, miracles, her recent conversion, and being married to Jordan. Today's episode was a production of Think Faith in partnership with Genexis and support from the Jerusalem Trust. Editing assistance by Isaac Simmons. You can find links to the book and all our featured guests with the show notes. Please do subscribe to this podcast, rate and review us too, tell others, share it on your social media. It all helps others to find us. Plus, you can get the next episode you just heard a clip from two weeks early when you support now at justinbriley.com. Again, the link is with today's show. See you next time.
Thanks for listening today and to Ellis, who left this review saying, one of the best podcasts I've ever listened to. Historical, insightful, reasoned and full of heart. So necessary in a culture that has forgotten why it is like it is. Just bought the book too. If you can leave a review, it helps others to discover the show. And if you want to buy the book, like Ellis did, you can get a signed copy from my website. As it happens, gold supporters of this show get signed editions of both my books anyway, plus lots of bonus content and early access. And of course, your support makes a huge difference to me being able to produce this podcast. So for the book or to support, visit justinbriley.com or follow the links with the show notes.